الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين Respected elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So last night we began a discussion and we mentioned that we're going to be exploring the story of Musa in the Quran, specifically from the period of his birth to the Exodus. And as an introduction, we mentioned that the reason why we've selected the story of Musa in particular is because he is the most mentioned prophet in the Qur'an, mentioned explicitly 136 times. And he's also part of the most important community mentioned in the Qur'an the children of Israel, Bani Israel, and they are the most mentioned community in the Qur'an. This is the only community where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about their inception and their entire life cycle and the various trials and tribulations they experienced. We also highlighted that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favored Bani Israel over all other nations. And we mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not arbitrarily favor people. There's a reason. And we mentioned that that reason is alluded to in Surah Al-Isra, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains that Bani Israel, what makes them special is they are ذُرِّيَّةَ مَنْ حَمَلْنَا مَعَ نُوحٍ إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَبْدًا شكورا. That the reason why Allah favored them and honored them is because these are the children of those who were with Nuh on the ark. And because Nuh was grateful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Nuh and all of those who were in the company of Nuh. Look at the power of gratitude. That to be with someone who is grateful, to follow someone who is among a shakirin you are included in that rahmah, you're included in that divine grace. Bani Israel, as we mentioned, they are the children of Israel, and Israel is the honorific title of Ya'qub. And Ya'qub is the grandson of Ibrahim. Now, Ibrahim and Ya'qub, they inhabited, for the most part, the territory of Jerusalem and modern-day Jordan. Now the question is, how did Bani Israel end up in Egypt? And the answer is, because of what the brothers of Yusuf tried to do to Yusuf. What's amazing is that when you look at Ya'qub and his sons, they were shepherds, simple shepherds living out in the country. And as we know, they had this jealousy towards their brother. But look at how the plan of Allah works. You have Egypt, which is the superpower of the time, the cradle of civilization. They are advanced in their science. They are the most cultured people. They have the best technology, the most wealthy. They have everything except for guidance. And this is also an important lesson. Just because you are a superpower, it doesn't mean that you're guided. You know, as Shaheed Mutahari used to say, that science gives you speed. But religion, but faith gives you direction. So Egypt was a superpower. And Allah wanted to bring the message of Tawheed 
to Egypt. How does he do it? Through the makr of the brothers of Yusuf. They have their own selfish interests. They want to get rid of Yusuf. But look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses their scheme to serve a higher purpose. The message of Tawheed is brought all the way to Egypt. So this is how Bani Israel ended up in Egypt. I don't think that if Yaqub and Yusuf tried to go and preach to the people of Egypt, they would have probably been rejected. It had to happen in this way for the message of Tawheed to reach the people of Egypt. When you look at Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Baqarah deals a lot with the story of Bani Israel. And for those of you who've started reading the Quran, the one juz per day, I'm sure you've covered a lot of those verses. We mentioned, we compared and contrasted the prophetic model with the Fir'auni model. We spoke about this a little bit yesterday. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, in Surah 28, verse 4, he says, Inna Fir'aun ala fil ard. Fir'aun exalted himself in the land. He was arrogant. Waja'ala ahlaha shia'a. And he divided his people. So the, fir the Fir'auni model of governance is one of arrogance. We are the superpower. Everyone else is inferior to us. There's also this element of divisiveness. Fir'aun understood that if he wants to solidify his power, he has to marginalize a certain group. Because one way to unite people is to tell them that they have a shared enemy, they have a common enemy. يُذَبِّحُ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ He was killing, he was committing genocide against the Israelites. No respect for human dignity. And we, it's important for us when we reflect on the Fir'auni model, you have to make connections today, you have to connect the dots. Because there are many superpowers today who are employing this Fir'auni model, the model of divisiveness, the model of arrogance, a model that does not respect human life. وَيَسْتَحْيُونَ نِسَاءَكُمْ وَفِي ذَلِكُمْ بَلَاءٌ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ عَظِيمٌ Killing their sons, sparing their daughters. And Allah mentions this in ayah number 49 of Surah Al-Baqarah. And this is significant because this is during the Madani period. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using the story of Bani Israel to remind the Muslims of the great favor that he has bestowed upon them. In the same way that Allah rescued Bani Israel from the persecution of Fir'aun, Allah is telling the Muslims, I also rescued you from the persecution you faced in Mecca. I rescued Bani Israel from that Fir'aun, and I rescued you from the Fir'auns of Abu Sufyan and Abu Jahl. You have to be grateful. Now when you look at the, the Fir'auni model, you see that Fir'aun represents the political element of that model. And as we mentioned, Fir'aun employed this politics of divisiveness, using fear and intimidation. And he also controls information that is given to the masses. And this is why he says, for instance, in Surah 40, verse 29, Surah Ghafir, قَالَ فِرْعَوْنُ مَا أُرِيكُمْ إِلَّا مَا أَرَى I'm only presenting to you what I understand. Meaning that he is controlling the narrative. So you have the Fir'auni model, you have the element of, the political element represented by Fir'aun. But Fir'aun cannot exist by himself. 
tyrannical governments, oppressive systems need support. And this is where you see the economic element in the Fir'auni system, the Fir'auni model, represented by Haman. When you look at the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Haman. Surah 28 verse 6, وَنُرِيَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَهَامَان Amazing. Haman is mentioned alongside Fir'aun. Who is Haman? You know, brothers and sisters, for many years, this individual, Haman, this verse in particular, was used to attack the legitimacy and the authenticity of the Qur'an. Why? Because critics of the Qur'an, skeptics, they would say that, look, whoever wrote the Qur'an made a mistake. Because Haman is the assistant of a Persian king who came long after Musa. Oh, these silly Muslims, they made an error. In the book of Esther, in the Bible, it mentions Haman. So for many, many years, for hundreds of years, this verse would be used to undermine the argument that the Qur'an is the word of God. If it's the word of God, why would the author of the Qur'an make such a silly mistake and not know that Haman was the assistant of a Persian king who came long after Musa? This was the argument for many, many years and many Muslims did not have an answer until fairly recently hieroglyphics were discovered and they found the name Haman and he was described in the hieroglyphics as the stone builder. So Haman essentially represents the economic power of Fir'aun. An oppressor needs economic power. So you have Fir'aun, you have Haman, وَجُنُودَهُمَا the military element. The military element. Fir'aun had a massive military. So you have Haman, the political element. The Fir'aun, the political element. Haman, the economic element. You have the military component. وَجُنُودَهُمَا And then you have the magicians. The magicians are a very important part of the Fir'auni model. And what is the role of the magicians? Twofold. To create illusion. The Fir'auni system can only survive if you have this element of deception. This is a Fir'auni model. And if you want a contemporary example of this Fir'auni model, why did the U.S. invade Iraq? Weapons of mass destruction. They knew it was a lie. They knew it was a lie. Deception. So the Fir'auni model employs the magicians. You know, they were called magicians at that time. Now we call them politicians. Magicians. They create illusions. They cover up the truth. But magicians also do something else. They entertain. They entertain. And oppressive powers, one of the ways that they hold on to power is that they distract you. Bread and circus. Enjoy Monday night football while we run the world. Enjoy the sports and all the things that you like to watch. Stay distracted. Stay in a state of ghafla. The Fir'auni model wants you to be heedless. The Fir'auni model wants you to work day and night, just like the Hebrews in in Egypt, day and night working, building the pyramids, serving the Fir'auni establishment. What do we see today? 
day and night, working like robots, Monday through Friday, so we can give our attention to the magicians on Saturday and Sunday. That's, what's, that's what our lives have become. And you see that the prophetic model is the exact opposite, as I mentioned. That's why Musa is a threat. Because Musa, his message is not a message of divisiveness. Musa, number one, is humble. Not like in the Fir'aun ala fil ard. Musa is the opposite, humble. Fir'aun, as we said, he waja'ala ahlaha shi'a. He divided his people. Musa's message is what? It's a message of unity. Fir'aun is killing the children of Israel, the prophetic model is one of what? The respect for human life. You're Beni Adam. You are the children of that man to whom the angels prostrated. The elevation of, of human dignity. And you see in the story of Musa, what Musa brings destroys the magic of the, mag of the magicians. What Musa is presenting is haq. It's not a distraction. It's to awaken you from that state of delusion. Now, why... So now we fast forward. The Jews are now... The Bani Israel, they're now in Egypt. And, of course, they were welcomed the brothers of Yusuf, the family of, of Yusuf, they were welcomed. So the Egyptians, because they saw how much economic prosperity they enjoyed during the time of Yusuf, they welcomed the Jews, they welcomed the Hebrews, the Israelites into Egypt. So even though they were foreigners, they were welcomed from Canaan because they were related to Yusuf. So they were honored guests. So, gradually, they go from being honored guests to suspected terrorists. Why did Fir'aun kill the Israelites? Why did he start to commit genocide against Bani Israel? There are three opinions that have been put forward. When you look at the the Old Testament, when you look at the book of Exodus, you find that in the book of Exodus, it says that Fir'aun started to kill the Israelites as a form of population control. Because he did not want the demographic of Egypt to change. You know, it's very similar to what we see in, in modern times. You know, this fear of immigrants. You know, the white man is becoming extinct. We got to do something about this, right? So in Egypt, the same phenomenon. Fir'aun is seeing that these Israelites, mashallah, they're having a lot of children. They're going to outnumber us. So as a form of population control, he starts to kill them. And he does this by convincing the Coptics that these people are not loyal to Egypt. They, are, they will threaten our way of life. They are a threat to our culture. Now what's interesting is that when you look at Islamic sources, you find that there is a mentioning of a dream that Fir'aun has. The Ahadith mention that Fir'aun has a dream and in the dream, he sees a fire, a blaze, emerging from the direction of Jerusalem. And it enters Egypt, and it burns everything, and eviscerates everything except for Bani Israel. He wakes up, he summons his aides, you know, the, the high priests, the soothsayers, and he asks them to interpret the dream. And they tell him that a child will be born from among the children of Israel who will bring about the destruction of your empire. And this is what 
motivates him to issue that executive order to kill any newborn from Bani Israel. There's another narration from Imam al-Sadiq salawatullahi alayhi where he mentions a conversation that took place when Yusuf was on his deathbed. The hadith is mentioned by Shaykh al-Saduq in Kamaluddin. He says that, Imam al-Sadiq says that when Yusuf was on his deathbed, the family of Ya'qub, you know, the, his brothers and their children, the entire clan, the family of Ya'qub, they gathered around Yusuf. And Yusuf, of course, was a head of state. He was a very important personality. Eighty of them were surrounding his deathbed. And Yusuf alayhi salam, he gives a prophecy. He says, إِنَّهَا أُولَاءِ الْقِبْضِ سَيَظْهَرُونَ عَلَيْكُمْ That these Coptics will gain power over you. So at, during Yusuf's time, the Israelites, they had proximity to power. The government favored the Israelites. But Yusuf is telling them that after me, things are going to change. The Coptics are going to gain power and they will subject you to a lot of torment but don't lose hope because Allah will save you through a man from the progeny of Lawi Levi who is the one of the brothers of Yusuf and this is Musa What's interesting about the story of Musa is that the Israelites are told that you're going to go through a period of great suffering, a period of trial and tribulation for hundreds of years. And a Savior will reappear. A Savior will come. And that Savior is Musa, who's from the progeny of Lawi. And he says that he is a tall man with curly hair. Now this prophecy reaches Fir'aun. Somehow Fir'aun hears about this prophecy. And he's told, the narration says that the priest, the dream, the, the, you know, some of his aides told him that the Israelites are waiting for this savior. So that's when he starts to implement uh, the killing of the Israelites. Here you see there are some important parallels to draw between Islamic history and Jewish history. And this is where we see that Bani Israel were essentially waiting. They were in a state of intibar. They were waiting for the vuhur of Musa. And similarly today, we are also awaiting the vuhur of the 12th Imam. Yusuf alayhi salam gave Bani Israel the glad tidings of the advent of Musa. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa also gave the Muslims the glad tidings of the emergence of the Mahdi, sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now the question is, why were the Israelites enslaved? If Yusuf alayhi salam had a high position in Egypt, and if Bani Israel were invited to Egypt, they were honored because they are connected to Yusuf. What happened? How did they go from people who had proximity to power to a community of slaves? When you look at ancient Egyptian history, there are approximately 32 dynasties that ruled Egypt in ancient times. What's amazing about the Quran is that you notice the ruler of Egypt during the time of 
Musa is called Fir'aun. But the leader, the ruler of Egypt during the time of Yusuf is called what? The king. He's not called Pharaoh. And this, again, for a long time was used as a criticism against the Qur'an. Because when you look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament refers to the ruler of Egypt during the time of Yusuf as Pharaoh. But the Qur'an refers to the ruler of Egypt during the time of Yusuf as the king. And the reason is because and I don't want to go into too much uh, history. When Yusuf, when Yusuf entered Egypt, Egypt was being ruled by an invader, a foreign invader, the Hyksos dynasty. The Hyksos dynasty was not Egyptian. And Hyksos literally means the shepherd kings because they occupied the outskirts of Egypt. They invaded and they took control. The Hyksos were called kings. So you have this little gap in Egyptian history where you have pharaohs after pharaohs after pharaohs. The Hyksos dynasties takes over and then you have kings and then the Egyptian pharaohs regain power. When the Qur'an speaks about the story of Yusuf, it makes it a point to mention the subtlety. That during the time of Yusuf, the ruler is a king. He's called Malik. And then, the pharaohs regain power. Now when the pharaohs regained power, they took out their anger on the Israelites because they were close and they were favored by the Hyksos dynasty. So because they are now in power, typically what happens when a revolution takes place? You overthrow the government and you subjugate those who were previously in power or those who were favored by the political establishment. Then you have the Israelites being enslaved. Now, how much time do I have left, by the way? 45 minutes? Five minutes. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now you can imagine, Fir'aun issues this order to have every newborn male killed. Now you can imagine that the men of Bani Israel probably wanted to be very careful not to conceive. Why would you want to conceive and risk having your child killed? So many of the Bani Israel, the men in particular, they made a decision not to lay with their wives because of fear that they might conceive and give birth to a male and, and have that, their uh, child slaughtered. There was one man who had hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that maybe the prophecy of Yusuf will be fulfilled in my, through my lineage. And that was Imran, the father of Musa alayhi salam. Musa, the father of Musa, Imran, he laid with his wife, she conceived. He was later captured. And that's why we don't really have any information about Imran. Most likely he was apprehended and killed by the forces of Fir'aun. His wife becomes pregnant. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now you may wonder how is the Savior going to be born under such circumstances? And in fact, many of the Israelites were wondering, how is it possible for us, for a Savior to be born in this type of climate? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He wants something to happen, it will happen. Imam al-Baqir salawatullahi alayhi He says, Inna Musa, Inna Ummi Musa, Inna Umma Musa lamma hamalat bihi, Inna Musa lamma hamalat bihi ummu. When Musa's mother was pregnant with Musa, 
لم يظهر حملها إلا عند وضع Imam al-Baqir says that when Musa's mother was pregnant her pregnancy was concealed and then the Imam says وَكَانَ فِرْعَوْنَ قَدْ وَكَّلَ بِنِسَاءِ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ نِسَاءً مِنَ الْقِبْضِ يَحْفَظْنَهُمْ Fir'aun appointed midwives in the town of Goshen, which was the, the district that Bani Israel lived in. There were midwives stationed at the door of every home to monitor, to see if the child will be male or female. And these midwives were Coptic, and they were watching. And this is where Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, فِي الْقَائِمِ سُنَّةٌ مِّن مُوسَى There are some, Imam al-Sadiq says, there are some similarities between Musa and Imam al-Mahdi. عَجْلَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فَرَجَى So the narrator asks Imam al-Sadiq, what are, what are the similarities between Imam al-Mahdi and Musa? The Imam says, خَفَاءُ مَوْلِدِهِ The concealment of his birth. That's number one. Narjis, her pregnancy was concealed. He was delivered in secrecy. Imam al-Mahdi was also delivered in secrecy. وَغَيْبَتُهُ عَنْ قَوْمِهِ Musa experienced a ghaybah. What ghaybah? As we will speak about, when he killed the Coptic, he disappeared. He went to Median. He stayed in Median for 10 years and no one among Bani Israel knew what happened to him. He vanished. So, two similarities that we see. The secrecy of his birth is similar to Imam al-Mahdi and the occultation. Musa went into a 10-year occultation. No one knew what happened to him. And then he returns in the same way that Imam will return after his occultation. I think we'll continue the discussion uh, tomorrow night. Bi'idhnillah wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahireen.